Hello and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This time we have Nintendo Power number 32 for January of 1992. Nintendo Power is shaking things up a bit this time, so we've got some new stuff to discuss. Let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Super Castlevania 4 from Konami. I think this is our first cover that is an oil painting as opposed to a more conventional, just regular paint painting or a photograph or a diorama. In the lighter's column, well, after all the reader-submitted art covered last issue, this week we're getting more into that with sculptures and sewn plush figurines, figures, what have you. Our next game is our next Mega Man game. Mega Man 4, now with a new villain, villain Dr. Cossack. Well, actually not really Dr. Cossack, because Dr. Cossack is really a proxy for Dr. Wily. We have level maps for all the Robot Masters, but they don't really give a boss order. There's kind of an implied boss order based on what order the maps are done in, but it's not explicitly stated. We also don't get maps of Dr. Kozak's castle or Dr. Wily's castle. Now, Mega Man 4 and the rest of the series after this starts getting some crap for being too easy. In particular with this game, I hear it get crap for, well, the charge shot. I disagree. I think this game has the right amount of challenge, and it's certainly a fun game. It doesn't change things too mu up too much from the first few Mega Man games, aside from giving you the rush boost at the beginning, but I wouldn't call that a significant negative. I mean, if you didn't like the Mega Man games before, I don't think Mega Man 4 will turn you into a convert, which is the kind of thing where if the game was too easy is something where, if you found the games too hard, you might like this one, but if you like the Mega Man games, you're still going to like this one. If you don't like the Mega Man games, you're still not going to like this one. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Pretty clear cut. Still, I consider it fun. I think if you haven't made up your mind yet, it's worth your time and attention. Moving on, we have a game from Konami with Monster in My Pocket, based on a line of small plastic cast collectible toys. We have maps of the first three stages of the game. Monster in My Pocket is a little interesting, in that from a gameplay standpoint, it it's kind of a combination of Kung Fu with platforming elements. You have massive hordes of enemies attacking from the front and back as you move forward, with some platforming upwards and downwards, and leading you to constantly attack as you make your way through the level until you reach the end and fight a boss. Now this game isn't particularly deep by any means, but it's still enjoyable, certainly. I don't know if I'd call it a hidden gem. I might consider calling it that, considering the fact that it's a game where the reputation of games based off fairly little-known licensed toy properties like this are poor, and I consequently I expected this to kind of be shovelware, even though it came from Konami. But instead, it's a very entertaining game, and honestly, I... If I came across a copy of this and the price was right, I'd certainly pick up a copy. Sticking with some of the big names, next up is Tecmo with Tecmo Super Bowl. Rather than focusing on the team roster, instead the article covers the game mechanics of the, of the thing. Tecmo Super Bowl is a decent sports game with solid passing controls, which I admit took me a bit to figure out due to how I'm playing it. The one complaint I have with the game is with the passing. There are a few occasions where I selected a receiver who was wide open, but instead of passing it straight to him, I sent it to a spot about a mile in front of him, where there were more than a couple opposing players waiting to intercept the pass. Now, the game is still fun, I certainly find it entertaining to play a full season in the game, but, frankly, there are more recent football games, even on, you know, retro consoles like the SNES, which are more polished. Not just graphically, but gameplay wise. Well, here's one of the first big changes in, of this issue a new comic. A manga adaptation, though they don't call it that, of Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, past by manga legend Shotaro Ishinomori, creator of such classics as Cyborg 009 and Gigage no Getaro. And I apologize for mangling those names. Um, this manga is available from Viz in print right now as I'm recording this, so I'm not going to go too much in depth. 
um, because you could actually go read this right now. Something you can't really do with, say, well, frankly, Howard and Nestor, Nestor's Adventures, or the other new comic we're getting this issue, at least in terms of a semi-legal way. Anyway, this first installment sets up the first part of Link's quest, the search for the Master Sword. Now, the classified information column has also been tweaked. The portable and console sections have both been combined into one. And those have some flubs and headers in this section, which is kind of a bummer. Of note, this issue is information on the Master Class in F-Zero, which you unlock by beating the first three classes of the game. Moving on to Game Boy titles, we have Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, back from the sewers for the Game Boy. And we have maps for the first five stages. If Monsters in My Pocket was adapting the gameplay of Kung Fu and adding some platforming, this adds some brawler-esque depth and feel to some of the levels. It's not as blatantly easy as the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Game Boy game was either, but this game has some added wrinkles that makes it less enjoyable. In particular, instead of sticking with your turtle of choice, whoever he may be, when a turtle is defeated, they are imprisoned and have to be rescued between levels. Further, your life at the end of one level carries over in between levels. Now, add to this fact that turtles have longer reaches than others in combat, for some, some more than others, and it's not entirely intuitive. Donatello has a longer reach, certainly, but Leonardo has barely any reach at all. And further, since some bosses will counterattack you if you're too close, you get situations where you just can't beat some bosses, because the turtle you need against the boss, like Donatello, is imprisoned. Now, you can rescue imprisoned turtles in between levels, but the minigame to do so is fairly difficult and kind of not fun. Next is another licensed game with a title based on the Beetlejuice animated series, developed by Rare. We have maps of the first two levels of the house. Now, some minigame collections are fairly straightforward. You just do the minigames in sequence. In Beetlejuice, you have to navigate this haunted house to find each minigame, and beat them all in order to move on to the next stage. On its own, this would probably be fine. However, it's not that simple. As you make your way through the house, you also have to contend with other threats that can deal you damage, in addition to any damage you take or lives you lose from doing the minigames. Further, completing challenges doesn't get you health back or extra lives. Heck, I can't even find any way to get your health back or any extra lives for that matter, which means you have to beat each section section of the mansion in one go. Next is the first version of Prince of Persia we've covered thus far with the Game Boy port of the, ga of the PC game. We have maps of the first three sections of the game. Now this is a very solid version of Prince of Persia. We don't have any of the detailed backgrounds from the original game, but all of the incredibly fluid animation is still there and very clear. The controls are alright as well, considering that this is a effectively a two-button game not including your d-pad. I kind of wonder what a Game Boy port of Another World or Out of This World would be like, or for that matter, if this game would work on the NES as well. Next up is the second of our two new comics with Super Mario Adventures from Charlie Nozawa, the author of the manga Even a Monkey Can Draw Manga. This is actually a pretty good comedy manga with some great slapstick sequences. The formatting of Counselor's Corner has been adjusted again, and I kind of like this design. It's really well formatted, and the maps are done well. Next is our cover game, Super Castlevania 4, which has been mentioned in preview co coverage earlier, but I had held, held off on reviewing as I knew this issue was coming. We get maps of the first three or so levels, along with an overworld map on the poster. Super Castlevania 4 is an absolute classic of the action platformer genre. The music is excellent, the graphics are wonderfully intricate, the levels are spectacularly designed, and the introduction of the 8-way whip and the ability to jump onto stairs improves gameplay in wonderful ways that, unfortunately, I don't think any of the Castlevania games really matched in terms of incorporating these elements. Not to say the later games are bad, I absolutely love Rondo of Blood, but I'm just kind of shocked that none of the other later games, particularly ones with Belmonts with the whip, didn't use the eight-way whip, didn't use whip swinging, which seems like a no-brainer, 
and did not necessarily use jumping onto the stairs. Next up is our first article on Link to the Past. We have several upcoming articles on this, including one issue where it's the cover game, so I'm going to hold off on the review until then. This article has general gameplay notes, but no maps as yet. Next is a golf game, True Golf Classics, I'm going to mangle this, Why Alley Country Club, which is the first golf game we've covered thus far based on a real-world course. We have notes and thumbnail maps for all 18 holes. And we will see this course again later, or may see this course again later when we get into the Nintendo 64 era. Now, this game is utter crap. To be frank, most golf games in general handle the act of hitting a golf ball fairly well. It's a, using the classic two-click system. One click sets the power. The other click, you need to hit between within a sweet spot in order to get the ball where you want it to go. Instead, this game has the meter set the power, and then moves a targeting reticle on the golf ball to, to set it where you want it to hit. With the reticle moving automatically, it's a real pain in the butt. Additionally, and I don't know if this happens every time you play, or just this one time, but the weather conditions at this course are frankly terrible. Winds are generally 25 miles an hour and going across the hole, which means you basically have to try and slice every single time you take a shot, or hook, depending on the wind direction, in order to get it to go exactly where you want it to go. Now, I'm not familiar with the actual course, so it's entirely possible that this is emulating the course perfectly. However, if it is emulating the course that well, then they picked the wrong course for a game that handles taking your shot so differently from most other golf games. If you're doing a new method for handling your shots, you want to ease the player in. Now, I don't know enough about PGA Tour courses to tell you what one is ideal, weather-wise. Um, maybe the Portland Golf Club or something. But use a different course. Next is our first 16-bit remake with a Super Nintendo port of Super Off-Road, now without any celebrity endorsements. We have maps, more or less, of the first 15 tracks. Now, Super Off-Road plays almost exactly like the original NES Super Off-Road, except this version is a much better arcade port for good and for ill. If you like the original game, you'll love this one. If you couldn't stand the original game, you won't like this one either. It's the plain facts of the matter. The controls are identical. The um, boost and drive thing is all the same. Um, the one thing I'll say that makes this version different from the NES version is, again, it is arcade perfect with the little animation sequences that play at the start of races looking just as crisp and fluid as they do in the arcade version. Um, the NES version is incredibly lacking compared to the arcade version and the Super Nintendo port. Next is Nestor's Adventures, which is still here, in spite of the changes. So, bad news is, to a certain degree, certain values of bad, it is now shorter, going from two pages to just one. But there is good news. They have dumped the Walter Mitty fantasy elements, with Nestor now being in the just in the game world. And the quality of the tip has improved as well, with the advice or Act Razor this time, being that you focus your attacks on Pharaoh's base in that action stage. The Now Playing column has changed from just general information on the also rans to actual reviews. I'm not sure what I think about this. Because Nintendo Power is a house organ, having negative reviews feels off. As it's like, like the company who's putting your games on their system, or rather who you're making your games for, for their platform, that they're throwing you under the bus, to a certain degree. But on the other hand, if they don't do negative reviews, it feels dishonest. Additionally, with this format, we're actually getting less information about the titles being covered here as opposed to before, because it's set up as a conversational bit between two members of Nintendo Power staff. This is a particular problem with some of the strategy games being covered this time, like Koei's, I'm going to mangle this name, this name again, Le Emperor, Le Emperor, whatever, which is basically using the Nobunaga's ambition engine to handle the Napoleonic Wars. The top 30 column has now been modified. It is now the top 20. Sort of. It's 
I say sort of because now it has sections for each of Nintendo's three platforms that are active. The, the NES, the Super NES, and the Game Boy. Unfortunately, as part of this, we've lost the indicators stating whether a title is new to the list or not. I kind of missed that because it made putting together my best of the rest lists a little easier. In our celebrity profile this issue, we have a look at Bill Lambeer, who is attaching his name to Bill Lambeer's Combat Basketball, which I'll probably be talking about in the future. Since we're sticking with the um, Where Are They Now bit, Lambeer is currently the head coach of the New York Liberty in the WNBA. And he's still living up to his reputation as being an argumentative um, person, let's, let's just say. In the Pack Watch column, we have a look at the next Contra game, Contra Force. Now, wrapping up the issue, um, we get to something which hasn't come up previously in Nintendo Power. Uh, Nintendo Power has not discussed the antitrust litigation against Nintendo um, at all. And we have a notification here that it, that your certificate for $5 off any NES game is going to expire soon. This is the penalty that they received for losing the suit, is all Nintendo customers were to receive a certificate for $5 off the purchase of a game. And in particular, it's $5 off the purchase of any NES game. Um, so let's get to this real quick, so I can, so I can discuss this because it's important. You're giving a cert for $5 off any game when most games at this time are going to cost close to $30 to $50. That's a significant discount. I mean, it's 10% off a $50 game, but it's still really not much of a penalty for Nintendo because they're still making money off the sales of those games. Second, the coupon, because that's what it is. It's a coupon. It's all it really is. It's 5 bucks off. It is specifically worded to only be applicable towards NES games. Not Game Boy games. Not Super Nintendo games, not replacement controllers, not um, hardware, not you put it, putting it towards purchase of a Game Boy, just NES games. I understand the lawsuit was related to misconduct for the NES, as far as licensing agreements, publica publication, and that sort of thing. But still, if you want to empower customers, then empower customers have this certificate be for any Nintendo product able to be combined with any other offer or coupon. As before, we have the less obvious pick and the more obvious pick this issue. For the more obvious pick, we have, well, Super Castlevania 4. It's a significant improvement over earlier titles in the series in almost every respect. I'd almost have the less obvious pick be the Game Boy version of Prince of Persia if it weren't for the fact that we get a Super Nintendo version later. Instead, I'm going with Monster in My Pocket. It's a title I expected to be utter trash, but I ended up enjoying immensely. Props to Konami on this one. Thank you very much for watching. If you're interested in supporting the show, please support my Patreon. Link is up here on the YouTube channel. Any money tossed my way helps support the show and get things coming out a little more regularly, or rather keep things coming out regularly, and it also may help improve my production values. I additionally have a live stream that I do about weekly, um, and that's at twitch.tv slash count zero or. Um, additionally, the archive of the stream is currently going up on the YouTube channel Chopped Up Into Chunks. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.